It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. So let's just go ahead and get into it. Hey guys, I've had some of you reaching out to me saying, where are you? <laughs> what happened? You haven't put out a video in a while. So I thought I better get on and at least pop in and say hello so you don't start to worry. These past few weeks, I have felt so disconnected from the world and things that are going on because of all of the things that have been going on here in my personal life and family with school getting out, graduation, so much going on with that, so many activities and events over the past couple of weeks that it felt like I was just trying to catch my breath all the time. And then now that summer's here, all of my kids are home, and of course my husband works from home, so I feel like we always have a full house, and I seldom get any quiet time to prepare and record videos. <laughs> so as we speak, my son is rocking it out right now in his studio. He just got done with the drums, so I thought I would hurry and get on, but I hear him on his guitar, so that's probably quiet enough that it won't pick up on here, but I can still hear it. So for me, it's a distraction, but that's okay. <laughs> I've also been making and putting out content over on my other channel, The Happy House. You can find a link to that channel on this channel under the tab where you read all about this channel. So if you haven't already, go over to that channel and subscribe. It's a much smaller audience, but it's a place where I talk about more personal things. My hobbies, interests, personal and family life, you know, those kinds of things. So you'll find all of that over there. And over here, I like to stick to gospel topics, research, and documentaries. So this video is probably going to be pretty short, but I do have some screenshots that I've been wanting to talk about, so let's just go ahead and get into it. Okay, well it's no surprise that I often use this channel as a gathering place. I've had a lot of people over the years find my channel through one of my different videos that caught their interest, which brought them on board, and they've stayed for more ever since. And over the years, I've had the privilege to meet a lot of people through my channel that I otherwise wouldn't have had the chance to meet as they live all over the world. So that's been really rewarding. But I don't always take this channel as seriously as most YouTubers, such as looking at analytics and reports, or coming up with a formula that works to share these messages with more people, I usually just only have time to focus on the content itself with very little thought given to any particular formula or what day or what time to best release a video so it has a better chance of more people finding it. Anyways, a couple of weeks ago, this video popped up right here and there was that pay attention number 144, the gathering of Israel. So I kind of wondered, maybe there's something in this video for me. <laughs> now, this guy who runs this channel, he's a really nice, awesome Christian man who has multiple other YouTube channels, and he's doing a lot of great things, and his videos definitely aren't boring. So I took a moment and I played the video. He shows you some things to look at on your own channel, some things to be aware of and get familiar with. And one of the screens that he sent me to on my channel, there was that pay attention number again, 144. That same day, my son was performing at a local music festival, and one of the videos that I filmed of him happened to be 144.7 seconds. <laughs> And it's funny because it reminds me of how music is often a great way to gather people. We all gather people differently through our different talents and skills. And with my son, it's definitely music. He has a way of gathering in lots of people to hear him play his music. And it just had me thinking of all the different ways that we gather people into our lives, into our communities, into the gospel. 
just through these simple ways where we're using our gifts and talents. In fact, I was just reminded, I don't think I took a screenshot of this, but that came up in my personal study over the last week. I was studying that church manual for gospel principles, and in there, there was a whole section about our talents and gifts and how we are given those to help build the Lord's kingdom here on this earth. And again, that was a reminder to do more with the talents, gifts, and strengths that we've been given. And if we're doing the things that we enjoy that come natural and easy to us, it will draw people into our lives where we can have a profound influence over them just by doing things that we enjoy, that we're naturally good at. Here's a screenshot of my last video message that I put out on this channel. And of course, the day that I got onto my YouTube channel, there was that pay attention number 311, 3rd Nephi chapter 11. On this video, Christ came and kings are joining the church, which is a witness to 3rd Nephi chapter 11, which is all about Christ coming and his church. And of course, it continues to be a crazy season for storms and tornadoes, and we're now about to head into a crazy hurricane season, which is a witness to everyone of the significance of the times that we are living in. Here's a screenshot that a friend sent to me. It says, this crazy huge tornado hit Iowa today. It looks like a squid with legs. Each of those legs is a small tornado, and they are swirling around each other, creating one huge tornado. The comment section is from people who usually follow along with storm tracking. So many comments about this is so over-the-top bad this year. The storm's forming. It's unlike anything people have seen. A few comments noting that it's demonic and some people attributing it to cloud seeding as well. So here is a bigger image of this tornado up on the screen. Now as I read what she shared with me and I looked at this image, I was reminded of years ago when I did that video all about how I walked away from the world, all about exposing that whole world of all things new age. And if you've been with me for that long, you will remember that video. It's one of my more popular videos on this channel. It was actually a three-part series and it was almost impossible to put out on my channel. I've never experienced that much opposition in my life when trying to put out a video and it took days to finally get all the bugs fixed. It took a lot of fasting, a lot of praying, an army of people joining in on the fasting and praying. And during that whole experience, I shared in the video that followed. In fact, if I can find the clip, I will put it up right here on the screen. But when I took my laptop into the Apple store, after it was having all kinds of crazy weird problems, just while editing this video, which had never happened before and has never happened since. The Apple technicians working there that day said, whoa, what is happening right now to your computer? We've never seen anything like this before. This is weird. And as we got talking, I shared with them what this video was all about that I had been making and how I felt that the adversary was not happy about that. So this was probably some kind of attack from him. And one of those attacks, again, if I can find the clip, I'll put it up on the screen right here, was these black tentacles. It looked like octopus legs or octopus tentacles or black slimy ivy crawling all over the screen of my laptop until the whole screen turned black. It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. And when I looked at this image of this tornado and my friend shared with me the comments how a lot of people were saying that this looked like octopus tentacles and it looked demonic. It reminded me of that attack from the adversary about six years ago. So just a reminder that as temples spread across the earth, as the kingdom of God continues to grow, 
the adversary continues to be on the attack, whether it's through man-made or natural disasters. We can see the work of the destroyer taking place right now all around us. Here's something that someone sent me, a baseball score from Hawaii's team. It says 3-1-1, and he said, I thought you might like to see this. Now, the word that stood out to me on here was final. When I hear final, I think of the final countdown or the final winding up scenes. And another pay attention word was Hawaii. Also, the player in this photo has the number three on his jersey. So there again, pay attention. Now that photo was sent to me on May 16th, which was three days before that possible sign of Jonah, which was the 40 days after the eclipse. So I talked about a while ago in one of my videos that when I was reading in the scriptures about Jonah, it talked about after that eclipse, there was a 40 day warning for the people to repent. And so we're, a lot of people were calling this eclipse the sign of Jonah. I thought, well, could it be that we also see a 40-day warning period just like the people of Nineveh received? And with that number three that we just saw in that photo, it reminded me of how Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. And in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, it said, So shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Now, when I read about the Son of Man being in the heart of the earth, it makes me think of the heartland. And we were talking about this possible 40-day warning with the sign of Jonah with this eclipse over the heartland. And then in this photo with 311, we see Hawaii. Well, I decided to look up any news that happened on the day of that 40-day warning, which would have been May 19th. Well, here was the second biggest news headline of that day. Tsunami warning. A 7.7 .7 magnitude earthquake struck the South Pacific, triggering a tsunami warning for nearby nations. Now, this stood out to me. It says, the U.S. Tsunami Warning Center initially issued a tsunami alert for coasts within about 620 miles of the epicenter, but lifted the alert three hours after the quake struck the region. There again is that number three. The Hawaii Emergency Management Agency also confirmed no tsunami threat was expected for the western U.S. state. So the state of Hawaii avoided that destruction. They avoided that tsunami on the day of the end of the 40-day warning of the sign of Jonah or that great American eclipse. I often talk about third day power in this 11th hour and I talk about how all throughout scriptures in the Bible and the Book of Mormon, miracles always take place after the third day or on the third day. So it's interesting when I think about Jonah being in the belly of a fish for three days, that represented sort of a repentance period where a miracle was about to take place. And that miracle was Jonah preaching to the people of Nineveh and them actually receiving his warning and repenting and turning their hearts back to God, avoiding destruction. Now, speaking about hearts and the heart of the earth where the Savior went for three days and the heartland, here is a map that shows all of the destruction caused from the tornado activity that seemed to happen right after that great American eclipse over the heartland on April 8th. This is a map of all of the fatal tornadoes in the United States this year. Now, I decided to compare that to the map of those two X marks, the spots that I've shared in earlier videos. This is over the United States, and it has that sign of the compass or that Hebrew symbol representing the alpha, the beginning. I've showed that image before that people have shared with me that shows the map of the United States and the map of Israel with their similar eclipses. And the United States has the alpha sign and Israel has the omega sign and it's the first shall be last and the last shall be first. 
So we have an X marks the spot over Texas, which is where we see those fatal tornadoes. And then also an X marks the spot over the New Madrid fault line, which is where we see more fatal tornadoes. Well, I decided to line up these two maps and put one over the other. And look, you guys, look right there where the X marks the spot goes right through the epicenter of these tornadoes. So I decided to connect the outside dots and it made a circle. And then I noticed the X inside of the circle. Now where have we seen this before? Well first, let me just say it reminded me of the Cheyenne flag that I shared earlier this year in a video all about this great American eclipse and how those points line up, how it reminded me of the Cheyenne flag and I did a whole video about that and what that flag represents, what it means. Well anyways, here's that image up on the screen. The Cheyenne flag represents the morning star people. This is a symbol of the morning star. That's a topic that comes up a lot in my videos, especially pertaining to the Northern Lights and the constellations and also the people of the North, the tribes of the North. Now here is a map below of where the Cheyenne tribe used to occupy. You can see it goes all the way up to the border of Canada, all the way down into Texas and over to the New Madrid fault line in the Heartland. Well, this made me think of the Heartland model and the map connected to that. So these are the locations that took place in the Book of Mormon according to the Heartland theory. So here is that map up on the screen side by side with this other map of these images I've overlaid. And if you look on this Book of Mormon in North America map, you'll see this green circle right where the river, the Mississippi River goes up and it kind of forks. And you'll see right there it says New Madrid. That's the New Madrid fault line. This is the same spot where we see in the center of this circle where this X marks the spot is from this great American eclipse. This is believed to be the head of Sidon in the Book of Mormon. This is right at the tip of the land of Bountiful and the plains of the Nephites. And it reminded me of the Cheyenne, how they were known as a Plains Indian tribe. If you look on my map to the left and you look right to the center of that red circle that I drew based on the dots of those tornadoes, right in the center is the head of Sidon. Now this is where the northern Native American tribes believe that the Garden of Eden was located. They talk about how there is a cave and it contains the tomb of the first people on the earth. We also know from modern day revelation that the North American continent is the location of the Garden of Eden, specifically in Missouri. Here's a screenshot from bookofmormonevidence.org that talks about this river known as the River Sidon and how it's believed that this is the Mississippi River, which is also the main river that flowed out of the Garden of Eden. It says in Genesis chapter 2 verse 10, it quotes, And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became four heads. These four rivers could be any of the ones shown below. And of course, they have a map. It says Upper Mississippi, Lower Mississippi, Ohio, or the Missouri. And this is said to be the location in modern day Revelation where the city of the New Jerusalem will be located. This area has been a battleground for years with the adversary. And it reminds me of that hearsay conversation or so-called prophecy. Um, here's a, a screenshot of that. It says that this was supposedly a conversation between Heber C. Kimball and Amanda H. Wilcox in Salt Lake City in May 1868, where she reported him as saying, quote, the western boundaries of the state of Missouri will be swept so clean of its inhabitants that, as President Young tells us, when we return to that place, there will not be left so much as a yellow dog to wag his tail. 
It's believed that this prophecy was regarding the civil war, so it's already been fulfilled with all of that destruction. But here we are again in 2024 with that area clearly being marked with the X marks the spot and all of the destruction with these record tornadoes. Well now, let's talk about the circle with the cross in the center. This symbol has a lot of names. Here is a screenshot where someone made a, an observation. It says Earth E equals MC square. So they're saying that this is a symbol of the Earth. Of course, you have the four directions, north, south, east, west, inside of a circle. Uh, this says the glyph of earth shows the cross of matter, capital M, enclosed in the circle of spirit. It shows that on earth there is no separation between matter and spirit. By observing the seen, we can also observe the unseen. As above, so below. Now, when I heard that, this sentence right here that says, there is no separation between matter and spirit. I thought of the word Mutter in German, which means mother. Matter sounds like Mutter. So you know how I am. I do this a lot in my videos. I went on a search to investigate the origins of the word Mutter and matter. And here's what I found. Well, hold that thought. Let me finish with this screenshot first. So down below that, I wrote, it's an ank, A-N-K-H, which is an ancient Egyptian symbol of immortality and renewal. The cross appears in endless pagan pre-Christian cultures. And then below that, the interpretation of the simple equilateral cross as a solar symbol in the Bronze Age religion, which was widespread in the 19th century scholarship. The cross in a circle was interpreted as a solar symbol derived from the interpretation of the disk of the sun as the wheel of the chariot of the sun god. So it's a symbol of the earth and it's a symbol of the sun. And then, of course, when I look at the symbol on the Cheyenne flag and I see a square, I see how the square has four corners, and I think of the four corners of the earth. And I'm reminded of the earth with the four directions when I look at that symbol that represents the morning star or the people of the morning star. So if the people on the earth are the people of the morning star, who is the morning star? We're getting there, but again, here is another symbol that reminds me of this image. This is the Native American medicine wheel, and as you can see, it's divided into four sections. It's got the X in the center of a circle, and it shows the four directions, north, south, east, west, and then it has these different categories, spiritual, physical, mental, and emotional, wind, earth, fire, water, and there's a lot more to it than this, but it's just interesting. It has the four colors, supposedly of the four races on the earth, the white man, the yellow man, the black man, and the red man. And as I look at this medicine wheel and I look at north and I see how it says winter and spiritual, it makes me think of my video about the people of the north and the northern lights and what that represents spiritually. I've talked about that in past videos. And of course, way up in the north, where the people of the north live, it feels like it's always winter. Okay, back to my question. Who is the morning star? So here I put a circle around that sentence. There is no separation between matter and spirit. And I heard, there is no separation between mother and spirit. So I decided to do a search of the origins of these words. And the German word for mother, which is Mutter, spelled M-U-T-T-E-R, which of course in English we would pronounce mutter or mutter, it means to whisper. Now this is interesting because I think of that still small voice that comes to us in the form of a whisper. And I often think of that as maybe our Heavenly Mother whispering to us just as I do with my children as a mother. When I want to comfort them, I whisper to them. And the word matter in English comes from a Latin word for timber 
or substance. So it makes me think of, in science, we think of atoms and we think of matter, substance. But it also means mother. So to me, that was fascinating. There is a connection between substance and the word mother. Matter makes up creation and it's connected to the word mother. Well, it gets even more fascinating. I was reminded of the symbol we know today as the peace sign. Well, when I looked up the origins of the peace sign, which I've talked about before in past videos, it's actually a, a modern day symbol that has to do with nuclear destruction. Um, it's known as the belly button symbol. That I did not know. We were just talking about Jonah being in the belly of the fish, which was right before he was birthed out of that fish. The symbol of new life that came to the people of Nineveh as they repented. But when I think of the belly button, I think of the umbilical cord that is attached between mother and baby when the baby is in the womb. And that is how the baby receives its nourishment, preparing it to be born and experience life. And we talk all about this in the temple. We talk all about the belly button or navel, and we talk about what that means and the blessings connected to that. And in Bryce Dunford's video, he goes into a lot of detail about this, and he does compare it to our Heavenly Mother. He says that is where we receive our spiritual nourishment. And that's why we have that reminder, that navel mark, that we need that nourishment constantly to our spirit so our spirit doesn't die. Now, anciently, this symbol is known as the Nordic rune. There again is that reminder of the North, the people of the North, Nordic. And it was known as TAC, T-A-C, which is translated to the Knot of the Fallen. You guys, when I heard that, again, it reminded me of a belly button because when you are cut off from your mother, when you're born, the doctor ties the umbilical cord into a knot after he cuts it, and that creates your belly button. Now, when Adam and Eve fell, they were cut off from the presence of the father. In essence, that's when we began to receive belly buttons, which is so interesting that this Nordic rune is called the knot of the fallen. So I wrote Adam and Eve fell, the belly button is a knot, and this also looks like to me the roots of a tree. And of course, a tree, when it puts its roots down into the earth, it receives nourishment from the earth. It makes me think of the tree of life and also the overall family tree, all of God's children on the earth. Here is an image of matter. This is an atom. Now this is interesting because when I looked at this, it reminded me of that scripture in Ezekiel chapter one. Here's a screenshot, starting in verse 15. Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one will upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a barrel, and they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they went, they went up on their four sides, and they turned not when they went. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about them, four. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them, and when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Well, Bible scholars today interpret this as a gyroscope, which of course looks just like an atom. It looks like this image up on the screen as we're talking about matter. And this is what came to mind. I found it interesting that this scripture talks about this gyroscope and its association with the spirit. Creatures coming and going from the earth, and when they are lifted up, this is by the means in which they are lifted. As I pondered this connection between the words matter and mother, 
The thought came into my mind as we've been hearing recently talk from President Holland about coming additional scripture. I wrote, Additional Records Revealing Heavenly Mother. I know I talked about this in my last video. I talked about this possibility that with coming revelation from new scriptures, from additional records soon to come forth, could those records contain scriptures and further revelation and truths about our Heavenly Mother? Well, anyways, as I pondered this, this scripture came to mind. Mosiah chapter 2 verse 26. I am old and am about to yield up this mortal frame to its mother earth. And I was reminded of how in the scriptures there is this connection between mother and earth. And how we hear it referenced as mother earth, mother nature. There's also this connection between mother and earth with Venus, the morning star, and then son of the morning, which is what Lucifer was known as. Again, who is the morning? Lucifer is a son of the morning. Off to the right, I pasted this. Isana Klesh is a traditional Native American conception of earth as a living creative mother. Her name literally translates to woman of earth or clay. The Apache nation has a rich history and culture of Isana Klesh. So when I have time, I would love to explore that further. I would love to read their stories or records about Isana Klesh. In other words, Mother Earth. I believe a lot of these records are still on the earth today with these tribes. And we know it's been prophesied that the day will come when these additional records from these tribes will come forth and be that added witness to the Book of Mormon and the Bible. So we'll have that additional witness that testifies of Jesus Christ and reveals that further truth. It's interesting to think that this is nothing new to Native American tribes, that this is knowledge they've had for centuries, passed down from generation to generation, and that it's always been on the earth, yet always dismissed as just legend or myth. I talk about this often in my videos. In fact, I will put some links down below if you're interested in this topic. Um, I've done quite a few videos about this where I compare the histories and the stories of different Native American tribes and how they testify of the Book of Mormon and what we believe and know as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And speaking of the Book of Mormon, Native Americans, and Hawaii, here's an email that I received that I just wanted to share. This just made me so happy. It says, Hi, Lindsay. I've emailed you a couple of times about how much I love your recent videos about Native American people. I'm Native American, Navajo, and Omaha, so I love what you have to say and how it relates to the Book of Mormon and the Gospel. I recently listened to this and know that you'd want to watch it. Um, so she has these two videos. I haven't had a chance to watch them yet, but I have pasted the links down below in the video description if you guys would like to watch it before I do my next video. Um, but she said, I live in Hawaii and started a Book of Mormon podcast and have interviewed a lot of Polynesian members here and love listening to their stories and testimonies. I have interviewed a few Native American members. Later this summer, I will release two interviews I did with a First Nations member and a Yakima and Tulalip Native member. They both had some very neat stories. They learned from their tribe about the white brother who came to their people and taught them. I want to help do what I can to help indigenous people find or come back to the gospel of Jesus Christ and receive all the promised blessings the Lord made to their ancestors and them. So I love what she is doing. I am going to include a link down below in my video description and I think I would love to have her on my channel. I usually don't do interviews, 
but I am very interested in this topic and I love what it is that she is doing. So anyways, if that's something you'd like to see, if you'd like me to reach out and, and do an interview, comment down below. I just get so excited about anything that has to do with the gathering of Israel and native tribes, whether here in North America or anywhere in the world for that matter. There have been videos popping up in my YouTube feed quite often from different Native Americans who are also members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints sharing how their stories of their people completely tie into the Book of Mormon and the Gospel of Jesus Christ. I love it. And here is a screenshot of a video that someone reached out to me and shared with me, but it's also a video that pops up a lot in my feed, so I've seen it. And I've also seen other of his videos because they pop up often as well. But I love that a lot of people have also been sending them to me, so it sounds like um, this is a topic that a lot of people are interested in. And I believe this man is speaking at the Book of Mormon Evidence Conferences. Um, it says, Chief Mitiga testifies that the Book of Mormon is a record of their people. It is a historical fact. And so someone reached out to me and said, have you seen this? It's quite interesting. And at the end, he mentions being responsible for 113 communities. So there's that pay attention number, 3rd Nephi chapter 11. That's all about gathering together at the temple and meeting the Savior. I also noticed the time that she sent this to me. It was at 11.30 p.m. There's that pay attention number again, 311, 3rd Nephi chapter 11, and 3rd day power in this 11th hour. Here's a screenshot of an upcoming event. I happen to notice this. And the day after I took a screenshot, a few of you have sent it to me as well. It says, in a rare event, six planets will align in a straight line on Monday, June 3rd, just before sunrise in the Northern Hemisphere. Well, right away, I noticed that the planet Venus was not in this lineup. So I googled it and I found this article. I believe this one might have been on space.com. It says, on June 4th, Venus lies directly behind the sun and therefore can't be seen. It's at its orbital point known as superior conjunction. It will be visible again in the west in the early evening toward the end of July. So this stood out to me, you guys, because we were just talking about Venus. We were talking about the morning star and this connection to mother. Venus is known as the morning star. And so this is interesting to me that Venus is in the headlines right now this week, especially with everything that I talked about in this video that seems to be pointing to mother, to a mother earth. And then here we have these planets lining up and the only planet missing is Venus because she will be behind the sun. Back to my friend's message about the tornadoes in the Midwest. Here's another screenshot that she shared with me. It says, one of the most ridiculous CC drop signatures I have ever seen. Two huge debris signatures in close proximity near Mount Etna. So apparently on May 21st, multiple tornadoes hit the Mount Etna, Iowa area, causing damage to wind turbines and starting a fire. So I looked up the word Etna. I know we've talked about that before on this channel because of Mount Etna, the volcano in Italy. And it actually means kernel or seed, but it can also mean little fire. And Etna is the name for one of the most active volcanoes in the world. And speaking of volcanoes, today that volcano in Iceland has been very active and again making headlines. According to the New York Times 47 minutes ago, this volcano spewed lava 150 feet into the air forcing an evacuation of businesses and people in the nearby town. And again, I've talked about before, I did a whole video about it. I will have the link down below if you haven't seen it. But I've talked about how the Lord uses volcanoes 
to gather his people. Another pay attention sign pointing us to the north. Speaking of man-made weather, here is a video that a friend shared with me, and apparently this has been circulating for years, but it's becoming harder and harder to find online. So I'll go ahead and just play this clip for you. Even backyard gardeners should take care of their plants. You can see scattered showers still showing up on the Pacific Northwest radar throughout the region, the heaviest and of course, well to our north. Here in Southern Oregon and Northern California, uh, we've got a bit of an unusual situation. Now this first portion of the radar cycle, fairly bland and typical, but then you see these bands of very distinct cloud cover moving into the region. That is not rain, that is not snow, believe it or not. Military aircraft flying through the region is dropping chaff. Small bits of aluminum, sometimes it's made of plastic or uh, even uh, metallicized, uh, metallicized paper products, but it's used as an anti-radar issue and obviously they're, they're practicing. Now they won't confirm that, but I was in the Marine Corps for many years and I'll tell you right now, that's what it is. Uh well, it was so interesting to me that this weatherman talked about the word chaff. He referred to that word that I talked all about a couple of videos ago when I talked about the Northern Lights, and I talked about this Hebrew symbol called Kaf, but it's also spelled K-H-A-F, and how it reminded me of the word Shaf, which is in the scriptures when referencing the last days, and we read about how the Shaf is divided from the wheat, and how it's driven with the whirlwind, and it's burned up with unquenchable fire. It's interesting that this is the word used to describe the particles that are released into the atmosphere to create a cloak from radar. I thought that was very interesting. And so it made me think that these particles being released into the atmosphere are undesirable particles, just like chaff is undesirable compared to wheat. So this has been going on for quite a while, but it's finally now starting to become the norm to talk about openly where people no longer think you're crazy for bringing it up. Now this next screenshot caught my attention because this last year, my family and I again went to Cancun and while we were there, we went to a monkey sanctuary and that's where we were introduced to howler monkeys. And <laughs> that was one of the most interesting experiences we've ever had with an animal. These monkeys produce a sound that's unlike anything we've ever heard before and it's very off-putting. <laughs> so they don't come across as very friendly. Well, anyways, this news headline came out of Mexico and it says, Howler monkeys dropping dead, falling from trees due to excessive heat wave. At least 83 howler monkeys were found dead in the Gulf Coast state of Tabasco. So in some parts of the world, we've had cooler temperatures much cooler than normal. And then in other parts of the world, there have been intense heat waves. So many extremes are happening right now. And as we've talked about before on this channel, how the poles are again shifting. And as I've recently talked about, when I hear the word poles, and then I think of the word extreme, I'm reminded of this upcoming election where we are all feeling this is probably going to be one of the most extreme and intense presidential election in U.S. history. And of course, while editing this video, that was the day that we had breaking news about the verdict of Trump's trial. So here's a screenshot I took of the story from the breaking headlines. It says, The tragic coda to the Trump trial is that Americans can no longer trust our system of justice. Faith has been squandered. Well, that stood out to me. It reminded me in the Book of Mormon where we read about the corruption of the judges in the land. We read about the Gadiatin robbers, the conspiracies and secret combinations, and of course, the corrupt judges. I always talk about how the Come Follow Me study seems to parallel what's going on in our day. In September, we will be studying the book of Helaman and 3rd Nephi. In Helaman chapter 38, we read about the murder of the chief judge. And we read about wicked judges who conspire because they want to have the people punish Nephi for speaking out against them and their laws. 
So there are people who agree with the judges, and then there's others who believe Nephi and know that he is a prophet. So Nephi tells the people that they've rebelled against God and will be punished if they don't repent. And he tells them to go find their chief judge who happens to be murdered by his brother who wants his position. So this is a chapter where we read about conspiracies, secret combinations to take down a chief judge for the want of power. And that's exactly what we see happening right now in the news. We see conspiring candidates or men going after a presidential candidate because of power. They want to be able to have that power in the government. They don't want that control taken away by someone in the White House who hasn't been compromised, who they can't control. There's a quote in this news article that says, It is never the law itself that is in the wrong. It is always some wicked interpreter of the law that has corrupted and abused it. So this reminds me of the Pharisees who conspired against Jesus, how they went to Pontius Pilate and they tried to get the people all riled up and create these false accusations so that they could justify the desire to have him crucified. And they always tried to take him down with their wicked interpretations of the law. Now, we've seen this other times throughout the scriptures and throughout history. We just, again, read and studied about this in Come, Follow Me with wicked King Noah and his priests who sought to take the life of Abinadi, the prophet. So Abinadi came along and was trying to help the people change and warn them of their coming destruction. And King Noah and his wicked priests, they abused the law. They interpreted it wickedly or falsely to justify their false accusations. And of course, we also saw this with the prophet Joseph Smith. We saw wicked men wickedly interpret the law and create false accusations to destroy the prophet and end his life. This is always the adversary's tactic when there's someone getting in the way of his plans for control. Here's another screenshot of the story. It says there never was any plausible evidence that Trump committed crimes. The law enforcers ended up becoming the law breakers. And then this screenshot sort of sums up this entire news story. It says, when a district attorney who is a powerful force in government abuses his position of trust to subvert the legal process, and when a judge acts in concert to dismantle the due process rights of the accused, our system of justice is threatened. Reverence to the rule of law is lost. So it's interesting to see that what this attempt to remove President Trump from this race, what it ended up doing was the opposite. It ended up backfiring. And what everyone's been noticing is that a lot of people who used to be against President Trump and didn't want him to win this next election, they are now supporting him. They are now making donations to his campaign. They are standing up for him. Uh, it's been a real wake-up call, a real eye-opener for a lot of people to see what's really been going on. And it's angered a lot of people to see that this is what our country has come to, that there is so much corruption that's not even being hidden. It's out in the open and it's being exposed. With everyone on both sides of the aisle now realizing that this is not okay, and if it can happen to President Trump, it can happen to anyone. This has been something that has really united the country during a time where it is feeling so divided. So there have been a lot of people coming together saying, you know what, I was against you, but now I am for you because this is complete injustice and it's not okay. It really creates quite a distrust within our country. And especially with the timing of this, with all of Hollywood and all of these other elite groups of people being exposed for their crimes and corruption and secret combinations, with something coming out in the news just about every day, there's always a new story, a new person coming forward. It's interesting the timing of this that we're also seeing it be exposed right in the open with our justice system. 
It really does feel as though our justice system is hanging by a thread, as though our rights and freedoms are hanging by a thread, as though the Constitution itself is hanging by a thread. And we know that this is something that the adversary seeks to destroy. Also on the front page headlines, the day of this trial verdict where Trump was found guilty of made-up crimes was this story. The story circulated back into the news. Aliens that landed in family's backyard used cloaking device to hide from humans. So I just couldn't believe it. I thought, oh my goodness, it's crazy that we live in a day and age where these stories make the same front page headlines as breaking news, such as the, the verdict of Trump's trial. So my kids and I kind of joked about this and we said, well, maybe this will be plan C. You know, they've gone through plan A and plan B to try to take out President Trump out of this race. Well, this might be their plan C. <laughs> we joked that maybe there's so much talk lately about aliens and UFOs where it's become the norm. They talk about it in Congress. They talk about it um, in the news on the front page headlines quite often. We just kind of joked, you know, we wouldn't be surprised if plan C was a staged alien invasion or some kind of huge distraction to throw off the elections or get everybody to focus on a false flag, something to take their mind off of the main event, or something to give the opportunity to the current president in the White House to come across as a hero or a savior to save everyone from some impending disaster. At this point, it really wouldn't surprise us if this were to happen. So apparently in this article, they were sharing the news that AI software was used to determine if this was a legit story. And it was determined that it indeed was, that AI software had proven that this was real. So I haven't watched the video, but of course there is a video where they film these beings in their backyard and then suddenly they disappear. And apparently the family calls 911 and when police get there, there's nothing there. And so they all determined that something was used, some kind of technology to cloak the spacecraft and the beings. But you know, I've always said in these videos, it's always been my belief that aliens are demonic, that they are actually part of the adversary's plan, part of his deception. Here's a screenshot that popped up a few days ago. It says, two thirds in the United States Fear violence could follow the election. And as I read the story, it said that both sides, red and blue, felt that no matter who wins this election, there will be violence that follows. And then, of course, as I read the comments, there were a lot of people saying, it's almost as though the people who write these articles are trying to do a self-fulfilling prophecy that if we put it out there, it will happen. Some people said it's almost as though this article was meant to start riling people up right now ahead of the election and start creating that division right now. So feelings and emotions are intense and extreme and we'll only build from there as we get closer to the election. So a lot of people weren't happy with this news story and said, this has got to stop. Another story that has popped up that a few of you have shared with me, here's a screenshot, is reports of sunflowers starting to turn away from the sun. So instead of facing the sun and following the sun, they are turning away from the sun. Now, I haven't been able to spend much time looking into this and verifying it. And of course, where I live, it's not the season yet for sunflowers, but there have been people posting videos showing sunflowers in other parts of the world where they are turned away from the sun. I only came across one video where a farmer said, oh, that's normal, it's actually a myth, they don't really follow the sun, they usually just always face east no matter what, and then once the sun passes over, they stay facing east. But all the other videos I have found out there, including this one, Here's a screenshot, which says time-lapse photography of sunflowers tracking the sun. It shows sunflowers following the sun. I have come across video after video after video 
of this being the case where it is the norm for sunflowers to follow the sun. And there was that pay attention number 144 on this video. So if any of you out there are aware of this story or you've had time to look into it and verify if there's any truth to this, please comment down below. So the day before I received this message about sunflowers and the sun, I thought it was really interesting. It stood out to me as something to pay attention to because the day before, I was thinking all about sunflowers. As you can see, I have this shirt. Here's a screenshot and it has a sunflower on it. And I happened to be wearing this shirt the day before I received this message. And I also was wearing sunflower earrings. And I remember when I put those earrings on and I noticed how they matched the shirt so well, I remember thinking to myself, there's just something about sunflowers that are so cool. And I remember thinking, you know, they're not in season right now where I live. You don't see them outside. And so usually you connect them more with like August and September, usually the fall. And so I thought, is it too early to be wearing sunflowers? <laughs> and I thought, no, it's not. Sunflowers are so cool. They're so pretty. I love it. I'm going to wear them. So they were already on my mind. And then the very next day, there was that other witness to pay attention to sunflowers. Now, speaking of the sun, here is a news article that just came out in the past six hours. It says that giant sunspot that supercharged auroras on Earth, it's back and may amp up the northern lights with June solar storms. And then just a few days ago, a solar flare classified as an X2.8 marked one of the most intense solar events in recent years. A powerful solar flare classified as an X2.8 erupted from the sun. I don't know if anyone else noticed this or experienced this, but over the weekend, it just felt like there were a lot of intense and extreme emotions happening with people. Very extreme. And it really seems as though there's a connection. Well, last week, a video popped up in my feed that I'm sure many of you have seen before because apparently this happened in November, so it's old news, but I don't remember hearing anything about it. And I saw the video, it was a couple dancing at their wedding when suddenly the ceiling catches fire and collapses on all of their guests, killing a lot of people. Now, usually with those reels, there's no source attached, so you have to go do your homework. So I went and researched this story, and here's what I found. Here's a screenshot. There was that pay attention number 311. It says, on Monday, the Nineveh Health Department updated the death toll to 113, including 41 who have not been identified yet. It is said that 12 people who suffered severe burns were sent for treatment. The tragedy was the latest to hit Iraq's Christian minority, which has dwindled to a fraction of its former size over the past two decades. The decline started before the militant Islamic State group's persecution of religious minorities after the extremists captured large parts of Iraq in 2014. Christians were among groups targeted by militants as security broke down after the 2003 U.S.-led invasion that overthrew Saddam Hussein. The number of Christians in Iraq today is estimated at 150,000, compared to the 1.5 million in 2003. Iraq's total population is over 40 million. So I found a news interview in the days that followed after this event happened, and the bride and the groom were in complete distress. They were absolutely devastated and still in shock. And they were saying how they were all going to leave, that they didn't plan on staying there anymore because they didn't feel safe. And it had me thinking about all of these refugees who have been leaving the Middle East and going to safer places in the world, how so many of them have been turning Christian or if they were already Christian, have been joining the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Well, speaking of the gathering, a friend reached out to me this week 
and shared this with me. It says, hey, didn't know if you saw this, but this is history in the making. Last week, Utah announced its first Spanish steak ever. This shows the Lord's work is hastening. I'm currently in a Tongan steak, and last week our steak actually split, and I'm now a part of a brand new Tongan steak. And I'm now a part of a brand new Tongan steak. He said, today I was attending my niece's mission farewell in Orem, and she goes to a Samoan ward in the Orem Tongan second steak. And they announced in sacrament meeting a third steak in Utah County, which will be called the Lehigh Tongan third steak. That's now seven total Tongan steaks in Utah, three in Utah County and four in Salt Lake County. And now a new Spanish steak. Our steak proposed a new steak two years ago, and it was denied, but this year it was approved. This all came so suddenly, and Elder Black, the Area 70 of Utah, had presided over our state conference and mentioned last week that the Lord's work is growing faster and the train is moving. This is a testimony to me that God is gathering His children from all over the earth. Well, anyways, I was unaware that we didn't already have a Spanish stake in Utah. Just because there's such a big Spanish-speaking population in Utah, this was a surprise to me. But now that I know this is a new thing, I am celebrating. Now, a couple weeks ago, a video popped up while I was out in my garden, and I really enjoyed it. So I subscribed to this man's channel, and I've included a link down below if you want to watch this video. But he did an interview with some members of the church all about the progress and the growth of the church in Mongolia. And I just got so excited listening to this because as I've talked about in recent videos, this is a topic that keeps coming up. There is so much growth happening right now all over the world. And these temples popping up everywhere is just a witness of that. But we have growth in Africa, Asia, the nations of the Middle East, outside of the Middle East, the people who have left, they are finding the gospel and joining the church. This is the ideal time right now to serve a mission because the field is ready to harvest. Incredible things are happening and it's so exciting to see that it's also happening right here in Utah. In fact, in that video about the growth of the church in Mongolia, the man being interviewed brings up a story of a sister in Mongolia who gets called to serve her mission in Utah. And she's very disappointed because she thinks, well, how are they going to use me in Utah? Isn't everybody there already a member? <laughs> and she had to be told, no, actually, that's not true. There's a lot of work to be done in Utah. There's a lot of people who know nothing about the restored gospel, who live there or have recently moved there. And so to just see a witness of that with the explosion of these stakes here in Utah is absolutely incredible. And I talked about with my friend how this just reminds me of the different tribes of Israel gathering in as they gather in with their people into the stakes of Zion. We see them coming together all over the world as they form these new stakes. And it is so exciting. While I was editing this video this week, this popped up from President Nelson and I absolutely loved it. So I'm just going to read it to you in case you haven't yet seen it. He talks about numbers and he says, I am soon approaching my 100th birthday. One of the places where the Savior used the number 100 in the scriptures was the parable of the lost sheep. Though 99 of his flock were safely by his side, the shepherd went in search of the one who was lost. At age 99, I have no need of physical gifts, but one spiritual offering that would brighten my life is for each of us to reach out to the one in our lives who may be feeling lost or alone. Over the coming months, I invite you to consider prayerfully who do you know who may be discouraged? Who might you need to reconcile with or ask for forgiveness? Has one name been on your mind lately? Though you haven't quite known why, 
As you bring these questions to the Lord, He will inspire you to know how you can reach out and lift one who needs help. What a beautiful example the Savior has shown us, that through each of us ministering to just one within our reach, we can spread the love of Jesus Christ throughout the world. Hashtag 99 plus one. I love this, and I noticed today at church during our sacrament meeting that the theme was all about Heavenly Father being aware of each of His children and knowing all of our needs and helping us feel loved. And it was a beautiful testimony meeting. It was amazing to me how every single testimony testified of that and also the house of the Lord, the temple. And as I looked around, I noticed there was that one. There was a person in the congregation who lives in our community who isn't a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And this person was there today sitting with a family. And I was so happy to see that. And it was just such a beautiful witness of the testimonies that were being born during the sacrament meeting. And so I just think this beautifully fits with President Nelson's message and his request for us to reach out to the one. I know that's why that person was at church today was because a family reached out to the one. Like I said, I feel like I've been sort of detached from everything that's going on in the world as of lately, but all the wonderful things that have been happening have definitely been on my radar and have really helped me to stay focused on all the amazing things that are happening in the Lord's kingdom, which makes sense as to why the adversary is heavy on the battlefield right now. Anyways, I hope you've been noticing too what the Lord is doing, not only in his kingdom, but in your life as well. I know that as you put your focus there, you will start to see all of the goodness going on right now amidst all the chaos and you will experience joy. I know that's true and I say it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me today, you guys. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I hope you have a wonderful week and I will see you next time. Do you suffer from dry, itchy, flaky skin? Tired of wasting money on products that don't work? Hi, I'm Lindsay Reach, the creator of Hydro Hill, a product that's been changing dry skin for almost two decades. I created Hydro Hill back in 2008 as a solution for my own dry feet. Countless pedicures and dermatologist visits weren't making a difference. And who has the time or energy for this method? Word on the street spread and Hydro Hill gained the attention of Shark Tank investors and venture capitalists launching it on a nationwide TV campaign, gaining interest and attention from celebrities on live TV. See it to believe it demos and try before you buy. Put Hydro Hill in the spotlight, selling out of product at every show. After my feet were transformed, I decided to test it on eczema, dry lips and hands, athlete's foot, and cradle cap. And the results were incredible. Brand new skin in just seven days. But it gets even better. Hydro Hill was also tested on a recovering hospital patient with an ongoing leg wound that would not close. After three days, this was the result. A wound that closed, healthy skin, and doctors were amazed. So how does Hydro Hill work? It's a solid ointment made from natural ingredients that turns into a liquid on contact with your skin, seeping down into deep cracks while acting like a bandage, creating an invisible barrier on the surface, protecting your skin from outside elements, allowing it to naturally repair from the inside out. Start feeling more comfortable in your skin today because everyone should love their skin. Click down below for a special offer or visit hydrohill.com.